Welcome back to the design huddle. Um, I was supposed to think of some clever hook to get everyone super engaged to <laughs> get excited about this episode. But um, of late, I've been watching a lot of YouTube um, and just learning more about content creation. This may come as a surprise to many of you, but Mustafa and I are actually not content creators by trade. So we're learning a lot of this. That's kind of like why we originally wanted to start design huddle. So today I thought we could kind of, you know, uh, pull back the curtain, talk a little bit about like what our strategy has been and also, um, talk about, you know, the seven best, uh, websites like that you probably don't know that you've never heard of that can kind of help with growing your podcast, YouTube channel, personal brand, anything in between. So I stumbled on some of these. I saw a handful of these on TikTok. I saw some of these as YouTube YouTube uh, creators have recommended. And I think there's one or two that you probably have heard of, but I just want to talk through um, the value of them. Um, so that's today's episode. The best websites that you probably have never heard of that will help you grow your small business and personal brand. But before that, Mustafa, how are you? Yeah, not too bad. Um, I'm fully vaccinated. <laughs> And we, we need a like some sort of like buzzer that we can hit to get everyone. That's great news. That's awesome. Yeah, well, I'm always um, are you, are yeah, you I'm feeling? always kind of reluctant to. Talk. Well, I'm all right. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't. I was always reluctant to say anything because I think one of the chat. I've seen people posting stuff on social media saying, "Ah, oh, but the fact that it's like it's kind of I don't know. I'm finding it a bit to be a bit crass, especially that the vaccine isn't in, in every country. So it's almost like boasting about something. I don't know. But yeah, no, I'm feeling all right. Um, I was a bit exhausted after the first one, but yeah, no, it's good. Yeah, I feel, I mean, just on that note, I feel super fortunate that we have the option. Um, people in other places are really struggling to have the option to get a vac vaccination. So yeah, uh, let's hope that the, you know, the progress continues because it's been great to see uh, the U.S. slowly getting back to normal. Um, I know some European countries are, have made great strides as well. So, um, yeah, let's, uh, let's dive into it. So today, first one I wanted to talk about is veed.io. So it's V E E D dot I O. And one of the most annoying parts of content creation, but, uh, important parts of content creation is creating subtitles. Um, subtitles for a lot of reasons are very important. One, just, you know, obviously it's great for accessibility Two, people are more and more in situations where they can't actually, you know, listen to audio example on a subway, don't have headphones, but you still want to consume content. If you don't have subtitles, you're basically immediately shutting off that, um, user group. So VED. I don't know if I'm saying it right. It's V E E D I O, um, is a video editing software. I think they give you a free trial, but it helps you create videos with a single click. You can add subtitles, transcribe audio, and you can actually do, um, a lot more. So Mustafa, I know you have been kind of the mastermind genius behind editing a lot of our YouTube videos. So I wanted to pick your brain. Do you see a tool like this helpful? first off and number two, um, what's the most painful part of like editing videos for you, uh, right now? Okay. I think firstly, I think the name is video, but they've done it's veed.io. So that's what they've tried to make the play on video. <laughs> oh yeah. That's <laughs> definitely what the, that. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly what it is. Video, it's supposed to be said video. I'm just reading it like an idiot. Um, it's supposed to be like no, video. no, it's because it's, it's V W it's V double E D dot I O, right? So it's video <laughs> <laughs> anyways. Um, the interesting thing with like video, it's like, cause the way the, the tool that we use, um, it's called Riverside to record the podcast. So it records video and audio, so which I think we should add to the list as well, but, um, the videos record separately. So I think one of the hard part is combine them together, but Riverside allows you an automated, an automated way to do that. The only challenge is if there's any gaps in the video or like sometimes we've had technical problems where one of our things don't work, then stitching stuff together becomes a bit harder. So it's like having the video side by side, surprisingly is a pain. 
Um, I've been using uh, iMovie to do that at times, but then iMovie is very basic, you know, uh, in terms of video editing. But for most simple stuff, it works. Um, and then another tool I've been using is OpenShot Video Editor, which is a lot more like a proper video editor, but it's like free as well. Um, so, yeah, most of these tools are quite hard when you feel like hard getting into an understanding to begin with. Um, so something like a simple editor, like on like video or vid.io, <laughs> whatever we're going to call it, um, is really, really cool. Anything that's web-based, that, that really helps. I think a lot of the tools are now moving to be purely web-based. In terms of like, um, uh, what do you call it, subtitles, I've noticed now what YouTube does is when you're scrolling videos, like the sort of like recommendations, if you pause on one of the recommendations, it will start playing, but with subtitles. So you can actually read it without listening to any audios. And that's actually quite nice. Um, so you can watch the first few minutes to see whether you're actually interested in the subject. So, yeah, no, I think this is a really good tool. Um, anything that just makes it really simple for content creation. Uh, I suppose the danger of these kind of tools is it means everyone starts creating content. And then, um, but then I suppose that's the difference between high quality and low quality. But, you know, I like the fact that you can adjust contrast and um, it seems that you can add imagery and stuff into this. So it's, it's, not, it's more than just... Um, adding subtitles and transcribing audio seems a lot more than just that, like simple video editing. Yeah, I mean, so originally, like, I was looking for good um, subtitle um, solutions, but they do a ton of stuff. I mean, they can they help you cut uh, video for social, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, etc., which is a huge pain point. So yeah. I was I work with a lot of content creators, and the, one of the most challenging thing is if you're a YouTuber and you want to cut your video and put it in portrait, there's a lot of editing that has to go in place to re yeah, basically repurpose that content, to push to social, cut it down to different lengths. So anywhere you can have, like, I think the ideal solution for content creators is you, you create like one high quality version of it, and then you can chop it down and basically export it to the different social platforms. Um, so it kind of fits that model. And there's like a, the least amount of like editing and additional work that needs to happen. Because you can imagine that if you're writing to Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, or YouTube, like that's, you know, five different platforms that you're creating content for. So having one place, the kind of one central piece of content that you're chopping up and repurposing is like, you know, the right way to do it. So yeah, video is a, is a, is a site that kind of, I just stumbled upon. Um, I'm going to kind of test it out over the next week, but I think that's a really good one to, uh, to start with. One, um, one, then... one thing to note is, um, like just looking at the price plans, it's generally free, like just to upload videos, obviously there's limitations, but if you actually want to do the branded stuff, so I think there's like a branding tools. I think th this is what's like making custom water, watermarks and stuff like that. Um, that's when you actually have to pay for like the pro version, which it seems to be 18 pounds a month. Now they've got like a deal on, um, which I think is might be $25 a month. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I think if you're going to do like professional things on a regular basis, it might be, it's, it's worth checking out. It'll be definitely worth checking out the free one, but I'd like to try I mean, it's a shame. I wonder if they, the tool actually allows you to try out the brand tools, but doesn't allow you to publish them just to see if it yeah. works. Um, but yeah, no, it's worth checking out. I think it's quite an interesting tool. V yeah, that one's <laughs> v video. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So number two, um, I think I sent to you as conversion.io, but the one I want to talk about is actually conversion.ai. And this tool is kind of unreal. So I've been, I really want to dive into this one. So, so how are we pronouncing what, this? Is it conversion? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, all of these, like, yeah, I mean, conversion.ai is what I think it is because it's basically this tool called Jarvis um, and Jarvis is uses AI. And I guess like a, I would imagine some sort of like machine learning to write high quality copy for ads, emails, websites, blogs, et cetera. So this is something that we're going to test. We're going to see who's better at writing blog posts, uh, Mustafa, myself, or versus the, versus the robots and the machines which I have a feeling the machines are 100% going to win, but <laughs> you, you want us to sign up right now and try all of we do this offline. <laughs> yeah, we should, I mean, I'm definitely signing up for this one, but they do a ton of stuff. But I, the reason I, I was kind of excited to check this out is 
this was really popular. Um, I fell down like a TikTok rabbit hole of content creation. And a lot of people do this for like, just like, you know, branding. So they pump out articles, but this helps you like auto generate a lot using top keywords. So I thought this was just like a really interesting way to, you know, write copy because writing gets difficult and it can be really hard to, um, you know, just keep, continue to think of ideas to write with. So even if this gave you like a, you know, some sort of kickstart to get the blog post written, I think this is a really cool um, tool. So I'm going to sign up and test it out, but I wanted to get your thoughts. Do you think that what I'm curious um, is, do you think you'll be able to tell that this is not written by a human or do you think it's going to come across as a little bit too stale or do you think that it's seen enough examples that it's going to come across as fairly human? Um, well, as you're talking, I was trying to sign up. It looks like you have to pay to actually use it. Um, so it will be interesting to actually see a demo before you actually uh, to understand how it actually works or suggest these things. Um, yeah, we can pull it up on YouTube, too, because there's a conversion AI service. If you just Boss search mode. that. So I'm just looking at the, the link. It says boss mode. Turn on boss mode to activate the control of AI and write two times faster. The, the thing is, it's like, what is the language that they're um, basing it on? Is it like American English, English, English? That would be interesting mm. to see. Um, I mean, there's a there's a tool that GitHub released recently where what Microsoft, who now owns GitHub, did was they looked at all of the public repos to create bare auto-complete for coding. And so some, develop saw that. some saw developers that. have found this really um, amazing. Like, you know, some, there's some controversy that it's like basing its um, patterns on other people's code, but you know, that's, that's a separate issue, I guess. But um, it's an interesting thing where you auto completing, not just like the words as, as you might get when now you see uh, writing apps do that, but actually completing entire sentences and maybe even a paragraph based on previous things that you've written or, similar things that other people have written. Um, I suppose if it's like an explainer type article where you try and explain like a, a complicated thing in simple language, something like that can be quite helpful because having analogies might be simple for you to understand, but not necessarily for like your wide audience. Um, but I think when it comes to say, like if you're writing a novel or something that's more, more emotive, emotional based, I'm not sure if a tool like this would actually be useful if it will make you write in a way that doesn't feel natural to you. Yeah, that's kind of my, my concern too, is that if you're going after a broad audience on a topic that just has like an explainer, um, it probably works well. But um, yeah, I guess like the whole value prop of the tool is high quality copy. So I, I would I would love to see some, some examples. So we'll have to do a little bit more digging on this one, but if you want to check it out, it's called conversion.ai. And the and gist of it is Jarvis that it obviously helps you is a reference. So yeah, Jarvis what? is obviously a reference. So they, Jarvis is obviously a reference to um, Iron Man, right? Um, is it is Jarvis. Iron Man or Bi Bicentennial Man? Uh, Jarvis is the um, AI in Iron Man's AI, right? Or like who becomes uh, Vision? Isn't it Jarvis? You sounds right. I, I figure. I mean, <laughs> Jarvis. I feel like that's used a ton for like. Yeah, I don't, I'm not sure what the Maybe. origin of it is. Anyways. Um, <laughs> yeah. So the next one is, uh, I, I, I thought it was super, it's a super cool concept for a website. So if you just go to good sales emails.com, it's just exactly what the domain is. Um, and you might be thinking to yourself, why would I ever need this? But if you're a startup or a small business and you're trying to think of like interesting, compelling copy to increase, you know, open rate CTA, but you know, like clicks on your CTAs within your emails, it basically will show you an entire company's email marketing campaign, which you're probably thinking I get emails all the time, but some of these are actually very catchy. And like the way the emails are framed probably are, would make me a little bit more compelling, compelled to read it or respond or engage. So, um, I personally think I am not very good at writing these type of emails, uh, doing outreach as a small business, like salesy emails can come across like pretty terribly and land, um, pretty like 
poorly. Yeah. So if you're looking for examples of how startups that probably have, you know, marketing and branding experts writing these, it's a great repository of sample emails. Yeah. I mean, I often look at the person sending it first. I, I mean, I'm, I'm starting to see some of these companies writing the subject line a bit like a Buzzfeed article, where they'll say, have you seen him? And I'll be like, what? The? <laughs> and then you open it and it's, it's not even related to anybody. Um, so it's like it, they're trying to catch you in. And I, I find those things a bit more insulting. But, yeah, no, they're having a proper strategy for email campaigns. Surprisingly, there was um, a designer who wrote a, a typography book, which name uh, eludes me. He was trying to uh, produce this. He produced this book online. Uh, it's free to read. But it was basically it opened up donations to see if it would make any money whatsoever. But what he found was having a newsletter and getting people go right directly to the website worked much better than social media. And having a newsletter which people subscribe to um, converted about, and he made the same amount of money that he would have made had he gone to like a big publisher, like, you know. Uh, so newsletters obviously work, especially if you're a business, like building up like a personal relationship with people who are directly interested. So I think having say like a thousand um people sign up to a newsletter who will actually buy into whatever it is that you're selling is much more meaningful than having a thousand like a hundred thousand who don't and maybe free might click on a link that you share so yeah and i think this is it's good having that um again i i'd be more cautious about using these templates verbatim i think you can take this as a starting point and maybe customize your own one um, yeah I, I i definitely would i would definitely encourage you know, writing your own. I think the thing that I think is the most helpful is the, is a, the structure of the emails, how long are they? What's the opening? What's the first sentence? How do they close? What imagery do they use? Those type of things I think are what you should take away. The other is, is that an email campaign, most people have obviously sent hundreds, thousands of emails in their career, but an email campaign is a much more targeted approach. How long was it between emails? You know, what's the difference between the first email, the second email and the third email? Like that type of like strategy, I don't think is like definitely not taught in business school. A lot of it is self-taught and just like trial and error. So the reason I thought this was interesting is that if you're trying to, for example, create your newsletter for the first time and increase readership, you can kind of play around with like how you're wording your first email versus your second email versus your third email. So. I love, I'm a big fan of like repositories like this. So like there's a ton of design tools that do this as well. They like take all of the icon, open, like free, like icon libraries from across the web and they put it all in one place. Like I love repositories like that. So you can kind of pick and choose as you, as you, as you go. So great it's free resource. Um, that one's called good sales emails. Um, anything else, Mustafa? No, I just open like up a lot. Yeah, and then I just, I was, uh, just looking at one of them, say survey monkey. Um, and so like the way, uh, the website's got it formats on day zero, the first thing that you send to them day four, you might a follow up, um, day 10, another follow up day 15, day 21, 26, 33, like they, it, they, uh, survey monkey obviously has, um, a pattern where they'll give some time in between. Although say like day zero, it's like, thank you for watching a quick demo. Um, love to get your feedback if you have 10 minutes to chat and it's like details of the sales representative. Then day four, it's like just following up on the last email. Are you interested to learn more? See, I, I, I don't know if 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 I haven't responded, something like that would make possibly annoy me. But then I'm, I'm unique, right? <laughs> and then like later on, it's like you know I've sent you a few emails, but I haven't heard back. Um, you know, it's, I don't know. I mean, if you become... think about it, they're just trying to close leads, right? So it's like yeah. To, to them, you're either you're either going to be a potential customer or you're a lost cause and they'll move on from. But I guess like there's like probably a sales tactic that says like you need to try X a number of times before someone actually like, you know, will yeah. try your product or service, for example. Like, I'm not an expert in this field. So clearly uh, Survey Monkey who know what they're doing, especially when it comes to email. Um, they've obviously had some kind of uplift as a result of doing this. So there may be something in there that works. Uh, and obviously for a big company, you, you cast the largest net wide net possible. And, you know, if you can raise your sales by 10%, that's quite huge. So 
But anyways, let's move on to the next one. Yeah, next one is called Pixel Hunter. It's a free AI image resizer for all social media. So I think we all know that like cropping each and every image across for each platform can get like really time consuming. So I finally found one catch all website that can kind of you upload one image and then it'll cut it um, based on the platform. So whether it's YouTube, Twitter, TikTok, LinkedIn, Pinterest, like it'll do it for you. Um, so like, for example, a good example is like for just Facebook, take one platform, right? You upload an image and there's a lot of different things you would need. One is your profile picture. The next is your image post. So what does the hero image look like of a particular article, for example? And then the third is like a cover photo. Um, those dimensions are all different. This will do it automatically for you. So it's cropping thoughtfully um, each image. Same with Instagram, right? It's everyone has gone through the struggle of trying to have a photo optimized for the square in feed post versus stories post. Um, there's nuances there. So this will help do it out of the box. Um, I can imagine that this saves a ton of time. And I think it's kind of cool that you just upload one high quality photo and it does all the magic behind the, behind the scenes. Have you seen anything like this, Mustafa? No, well, I mean, there's a tool which I designed called Squish, which was basically image compression. So, I mean, I think if you were to apply like something like that, like Photoshop or Squish to this, um, because basically this is about production, right? If you're producing content, you want to make it as quickly as possible. And so if you're able to upload an image somewhere, like produce the image, and then when you export it, it automatically sends it to this service, which produces all, and then you just have a folder um, and even taking it one step further that this app is connected to all of your social media apps. Then with one button, the moment you press, okay, I like this image, I've edited it or whatever, I press export, everything else is done automated. And then you can go to each platform and just confirm if you want or just automatically post if you, you're confident with it. Um, so yeah, this would actually save you time, but I feel like there's like one step that's missing where like it, the bit for creating the image should be connected to this and then the actual uploading of the image. Um, cause I think, imagine you, you just upload, uh, any image and then it will produce like, you know, this, it says 102 sizes we support. So presumably you download a folder, right? Once you've well, the one thing you mentioned too, which is actually a good point is that this is just, it sounds like it's just like cropping and cutting the photos based on the dimensions. Yeah. But I don't know that it's actually optimizing the images, like doing like lossless compression for lack of a better word, making an image file smaller. So it loads faster. Um, so that would be like kind of, a, a, something else I would want to know more about is like, if we actually uploaded an image, does it getting smaller? Or is it literally just cutting it to fit the dimensions for the platform? Yeah. I, I think in terms of file size, unless you're posting it on your own sites or within your own apps, presumably Facebook, uh, TikTok. Um, and Twitter and such will actually have a, a system when images are uploaded to op optimize them anyway. So you probably don't have to worry about that. However, if you're using it on your own things, that is something to consider. But yeah, I mean, again, this is like how to save you time because all that's really changing um, is, uh, you know, is the dimensions. It'll be interesting to see like if it's clever enough to get the, um, if there's like a person in a picture and if it centers them, or is it just basically from the middle doing a rough crop? Because from the example images that they have, it looks like that's how it's doing it. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, now, but again, anything that helps save you time, if you're a content creator, then stuff like this is really good because you need to do this. And the dimensions of, like you mentioned before, Instagram and YouTube are quite stark. And so once you commit to one platform, it's really hard to convert that content to another platform. So this will help. Yeah, I think that's, I mean, all of the ones that um, we're kind of talking about, I think the idea is to help content creators be more productive and save time. Like that's yeah. the bottom line is like ways to save time. And the other thing might be to increase quality, which takes me to the next one, which most people have probably heard of, but I have to say, I do use it. I think it's a very high quality tool, uh, which is Grammarly. I think most people have heard of it. They advertise a ton everywhere, but um, it basically helps you compose more clear mistake-free writing again it uses like ai it's a writing assistant 
Uh, fun fact, I'm not great at grammar. <laughs> so this is huge to just be another set of eyes on top of just like a basic spell check, um, particularly in uh, emails. So I think this is just like a good way to, uh, my favorite thing about it is it makes emails and writing more concise. It cuts out all of those like fluffy filler words that we kind of just put in. So um, yeah, have you used it before? Oh, absolutely. I use it religiously. I, I think whenever I write a bit of text, um, the first thing I'll do is grab, copy and paste a paragraph into Grammarly. And then immediately, I think, because also the way the tool is designed is when you're writing something, you say Gmail or whatever, you're distracted by a bunch of UI around it. Grammarly cuts everything out and it's just a plain screen. And so you your focus on the text changes as well. So you, you start noticing your own errors just like in, in as well. Um, yeah, no, I absolutely love it as a tool. Uh, especially like I have a tendency to write what they call passively. Um, and so that's just been educated by, by that and like better ways of just like, you know, making things simple and, and straight and direct. Yeah. I think email is an obvious one where people use it. I use it uh, a lot for, uh, medium posts. Yes. I'm really trying to just kind of hammer stuff out and get stuff like a draft done. It's basically, you know, when like, uh, you know, this is like dating myself a little bit, but you remember when you used to sell like a version of a document to someone and they would like kind of mark it up and then send it back like yeah. before pre Google docs. So, um, it basically is just giving you another set of eyes to make sure that what you're writing is clear and you don't have any major errors. Cause I do think that like good writing is something that I've been trying to personally get better at. And I think it, uh, it matters a lot when you read a really good medium post, you're like, wow, that was like concise. The messaging was clear. I only, it only took me five minutes to read it. And the person comes across looking with like a ton of credibility. So that's just something that I'm always like striving for. So I think Grammarly like, you know, helps you get there. Um, obviously if you work for Grammarly and you haven't hit us up for an ad sponsorship, like we'd love <laughs> to talk about this in every episode moving forward. So if you're listening and you're work for Grammarly, like, you know, Send us an email. We'd love no, to it's collaborate. A great, it's a great tool. Though. <laughs> we'll, we'll have a, um, a link in, in, in the description anyway, because for all of these tools. But, you yeah, know, I really like it. It's um, it's handy. And, I, again, just reiterating what you said, like if you read a, a blog post and there's a few words that's completely out or something's off, you mean, you're immediately reminded that you're reading something and it distracts you quite a lot. And I, uh, having mentioned this many times before, being dyslexic, that's one thing which... Um, I struggle with another tool that I used to use quite a bit is on Mac OS, you have something called universal controls where you can actually get the Mac to read the text back to you. I find that as a tool quite useful as well. So then, cause so having it read to you allows you to, to hear, to see if it makes sense in as a sentence, because obviously it will pause at full stops and whatever, or periods. Or whatever. Um, so that's also really useful. I think if you, if they were to combine speaking, a speaking element, I'm not sure if they do, um, then at least you can hear it a few times to see if it actually makes sense in a flow. Cause that's really important. But yeah, no, I really like Grammarly. Yeah. Yeah. Grammarly easy one. Um, cool. So we'll, we'll tie it up with the, the last two. Um, let's quickly talk about Riverside. So Mustafa and I started this podcast, you know, uh, I don't know, half a year ago at this point. And, uh, we were looking for a way we didn't just want to do audio We're like, if we're going to like, you know, catch up prep, do these do these episodes interview people it'd be great to have video like it's just crazy in today's age not to have at least video and audio so finding a solution that was like reasonably priced and gave us high quality video that we could you know chop up cut and and you know ultimately upload was difficult but riverside i like it a lot i i would give it for the price, and we don't pay a lot. I forget what we pay for annually, but it wasn't anything crazy. Um, the quality is good. The UI is fairly simple. And for the, you know, half dozen guests that we've interviewed, we haven't had a ton of technical issues. So I also think that it's gotten better month over month too. Like, I think maybe they're making performance enhancements. We just noticed today that there was some UI updates, but, um, I, the one thing that I, when I was thinking about starting a podcast years ago, I said, it just seems like too much work. 
So I want something that can do a lot of this out of the box for me, especially uh, for people that are doing this as a passion project, side hustle, whatever you want to call it. And I think Riverside gives you the rails to keep it simple, but also have um, quality in mind. What about you, Mustafa? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think when we're looking at different um, solutions, OBS kept coming up quite a bit. I think it was OBS yep. and link it to YouTube. But a lot of these tools required um, a lot of setup and knowledge of, of the setup. And obviously, we're just doing this on the side for fun um, more than anything else. So uh, Riverside really made it simple. I mean, you can use it for free. Uh, and then if you the paid service provides the video as well. I think that you have like um, a certain file space per month that you can get, so which is quite good if you're just doing an audio podcast. And then you just download it and you have a, the studio, which has uh, everybody's recording is separate. And then Riverside can help combine that for you, which is what we do with our videos. Audios, we just download as individual files and then use um, GarageBand to edit them like that. But, you yeah, know, it's, it's really, really cool. Uh, it's gotten much better over the last few months as we've started using it. So, yeah, I definitely recommend if you're interested in creating a podcast. Any, any like, things you would change about Riverside? Like, I mean, you're the one, the mastermind behind a lot of the editing. Is there anything that could make your creation process easier? I think if they were to combine some of the video editing tools that we saw earlier with um, what's called video <laughs> or veed.io. Yeah. Um, I wish I we got closed captioning out of the box. I think that's an easy one that would work. Yeah. would make everything um, a lot easier. I think, well, I mean, because we upload stuff to YouTube, I think YouTube may provide some of that as well. But if there was like basic um, video editing stuff, so if we could put, you know, like when we talk about websites, would be a nicer way to actually screen capture and put stuff in there. You can uh, do a, se a separate video when recording, but sometimes that's a bit of a pain when it comes to the editing process. So some a very simple uh, editing tool would be nice. Like if it was even like to the same level as Paint, like on Microsoft Paint, that would be enough just to um, just to make it like the whole process. So then you can just download the complete video and upload that direct to YouTube and completely cut out any other um, video editing thing. And the same with the podcast. So if they just made those um, editing tools just a bit um, visual, I think that would make the tool complete. Like then we won't have to, we just create, record and create and um, download everything within the tool. Um, and it's all web-based, which is great. So yeah, no, um, that would be the only thing I would change, I guess. Yeah, I, I told the web-based piece is so underrated, but being able to quickly copy and paste the URL to guests, like the guest setup to me, just sending a URL, having high quality video audio, they have tech like tests in place as well. So you can validate that like your video looks good, your audio levels are good. So again, for not being experts in podcasting or content creation, that's path, best easy, best way to kind of get started um, with very little like onboarding and like yeah. ramp up time. Yeah. I mean, so our guests have all commented on that. It's like, we just send them a link that we press record, they chat and that's it. They require nothing but a browser and then mic and whatever. So it, it's been great. Like for that. Yeah. I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. All right. The last one is called, um, uh, Descript. Um, again, this is another all in one audio video editing um, solution. So I think this would be <laughs> similar to Riverside, but I think this one had, um, um, has a little bit more functionality. I haven't checked, let me check out the pricing again. Yeah. So it's roughly for creators, it's $12 a month for their pro version. It's $24 a month. Um, and then the enterprise price isn't listed, but, um, a lot of it is done on storage and how much video space you're using. So I think that's the main thing to think about, but there's kind of the, the products broken up into four features. So there's like podcasting where again, you have a podcast editor for remote recording collaborations. I think that's basically like the Riverside version. There's a transcription, yeah. which brings in the video piece that we were talking about that you can automatically transcribe. Um, like what actually is being said in an episode, which is actually very compelling. So you could create an episode, have the audio, um, add the speaker notes. So it's kind of a summary of each episode. It gives you the ability to screen record, which, you know, I think Riverside does that pretty well. And then I think the one thing that this tool does, um, in addition 
is there's uh, some video editing as well. You can add titles, animation, music. So as Mustafa was just saying that he has to kind of take the video, export it into uh, a video editing software, like, you know, Final Cut, make edits and then upload. Um, if you could skip that step of exporting it to another tool and just doing it all in and then having a button that just says publish to YouTube, so you have that YouTube integration, that would be a, a dream scenario. So this is just another one to check out. I mean, I don't want to, you know, we've, we've been using Riverside. I don't think we would switch just because of the pricing and it meets our needs currently. But this is kind of the other option that I've seen uh, creators use a little bit more robust features. Maybe if you've been creating content a little bit longer, this will meet more of your, more of your needs. Um, yeah, no, I, actually, I have seen this before because you can edit the, you can edit the audio by editing the text. Cause what it does, it transcribes everything that's said in the podcast. So you can delete bits of text and you'll edit the audio equipment. So that's quite magical. Actually, we should maybe try, um, recording with one with, with this uh, an episode and just see just compare it'll be interesting to try out um yeah maybe we should try the free one we'll, we'll try this what sometime yeah yeah i mean that's that's pretty much those are the the ones that we wanted to talk about today so just in summary we had video uh v e e d i o for auto captioning generating subtitles conversion.ai writes copy for you using you know um artificial intelligence called Jarvis. There's good sales emails. So if you're looking to, you know, get ad deals, sell your product or service, make better newsletters, they give you can campaign templates for emails. Uh, Pixel Hunter, that's just the drop an image in, resize for all social, Grammarly, um, write better, copy, uh, spell check, um, write more concisely, use Grammarly. And then there's the two last ones we talked about, Riverside, which is what we use for our podcast um, to record um, both audio and video, and then uh, Descript, which is the one we just talked about, which does kind of uh, audio, video, as well as transcribing. So a lot of good options here. Um, if we missed anything, like Mustafa and I are again, like kind of new to the game. So if there's other things that you use in your daily workflow, comment in on our YouTube video. So this will be on YouTube. So if you haven't done so, jump over to YouTube, hit the subscribe button, leave us a comment of your favorite tools. And then we'll try to give a follow-up in a couple of weeks on some of these and whether or not they were actually helpful. But um, that's our list. Anything else, Mustafa? No, that sounds great. All right, cool. All right, thanks everyone for tuning in. We'll catch you on the next one. Take care. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Design Huddle. The opinions expressed are solely our own and do not express the views or opinions of our employer.